Well, thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. If I may, Mr. Speaker, I would like to begin by dedicating a Budget 2024 to the story of a 19-year-old who left his home in war-torn Europe in 1949 and found his way to Canada. With nothing but the shirt on his back, he dreamt of a new life and a new opportunity to go to university, to get a job, to raise a family and feel safe and free in his new country. Well, Mr. Speaker, that young man was able to work hard and, through being industrious, get into engineering at the University of Toronto, marry a beautiful woman, get a job in Montreal and raise three wonderful children. <laughs> that 19-year-old is about to have his 94th birthday, and while he never saw his parents again, as the Iron Curtain prohibited him from going back to his homeland, he lived the Ontario dream, he lived the Canadian dream. Mr. Speaker, that young man, that young man who came to Canada is my father. Mr. Speaker, that young man who came to Canada is my father, and I dedicate this budget to him and the hope and dream for all 16 million Ontarians that they can have the same opportunity as my father had, an opportunity to build a future right here in the great province of Ontario. Now, Mr. Speaker, on behalf of Premier Ford and our entire government, I am pleased to introduce the 2024 Ontario budget, our plan to build a better Ontario. On behalf of the Premier, Ford and all of our government, I am proud to present to you our budget for Ontario in 2024, our plan to build a better Ontario. Now, Mr. Speaker, as I am sure you are aware, the budget is a forward-looking document. It's a roadmap, a blueprint, and it's our plan to rebuild Ontario's economy. This budget provides certainty to markets and, as importantly, confidence to people that the government is prepared for whatever lies ahead, regardless of the challenges the national or global economy might throw our way. But before I turn my attention to the road ahead, Mr. Speaker, I would like quickly uh, to take us down the road just traveled. And much of this will not be news to the people of Ontario. It has been a challenging year. Life has rarely been this expensive. The Bank of Canada has for months now repeatedly raised interest rates at a big pace. The pace and frequency of the Bank of Canada rate hikes has been punishing, perhaps most of all on homeowners whose mortgages have in some cases increased by thousands of dollars a month, making matters worse. The federal government's carbon tax is making everything more expensive. From groceries to gas, the hardworking people of Ontario can't escape paying the high cost of the federal carbon tax. I almost can't believe I'm about to say this. The federal government is set to increase the carbon tax. It's astonishing. The people of Ontario, the people of Canada, cannot afford it. But more on that later, Mr. Speaker. Our public finances are also not immune to economic uncertainty. Even so, Mr. Speaker, and it might be an odd thing for a finance minister to say, but let me say it plainly. The pressure of managing a government, a government budget pales in comparison to the pressures many families face as they manage their family budget in a time when everything is costing more, or the challenges of a small business owner managing their budget in order to keep the lights on and keeping local workers employed. These are the real challenges and re the real problems of life and real people, of making rent, of paying the bills, of affording groceries. And the best way to help people is by getting the big decisions right, making smart investments, watching the expense line, and most of all, keeping costs low on people. That's why our plan to build a better Ontario helps them. Global economies have slowed, the cost of everything is higher, and so we've had two choices. Put the brakes on 
or keep going? Mr. Speaker, we choose to keep going to rebuild Ontario's economy because it is the right thing to do. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, we choose to keep going to rebuild Ontario's economy, and I think about the leaders who have come before. It was less than a month ago that our country lost one such statement statesman in the right honourable Brian Mulroney. Mr. Speaker, there is little left that can be said about Prime Minister Mulroney's legacy that has not already been said more eloquently by, by others, including, of course, his own daughter, the President of the Treasury Board, whom I'm so very fortunate to work with every single day. For the rest of us, I will say this, Mr. Speaker. Prime Minister Mulroney was a consequential leader who never backed down from the big challenges of his time. He was a leader who never shied away from using his time and power to try to accomplish big things for his fellow Canadians. What a great example for the rest of us to use our finite time in office to have the courage to implement the big ideas and try to accomplish big things for our fellow Ontarians. And in this budget, this is exactly what we intend to do. And this is important, Mr. Speaker, for the global and national challenges facing our public finances are real. Just as families and businesses are not immune to economic uncertainty, neither is government. Despite these challenges, we are delivering on our plan to build by inve investing and attracting better jobs. We're building roads, we're building highways, we're building public transit, all the while keeping costs down for families and businesses. And as you know, we consult widely with leading public and private sector economists in the establishing of our projections for future economic growth and inflation. And these projections now show that while economic growth is expected to significantly slow in the coming year, private sector forecasters are cautiously optimistic that it will not drop into negative territory before rebounding in subsequent years. Likewise, likewise we project inflation, as measured by the Consumer Price Index, to fall under 3 per cent this year before settling around 2 per cent in the following two years. And as inflation returns to the Bank of Canada target, we expect and continue to urge that interest rates should also decline. In fact, the people of Ontario are counting on it. The encouraging data is there, Mr. Speaker. There is a light at the end of the tunnel. We can see it. But that said, we are not out of the tunnel quite yet. The question is therefore straightforward. What are we to do today with the hand that we've been dealt? And there are options. There are choices. One choice would be to put the burden on taxpayers, to raise taxes, tolls, tuitions, or fees. Well, Nope. We are not going to do that. Rest assured. <laughs> a second choice, Mr. Speaker, would be to tighten our belts, to cut investment in housing, and cut investments in roads or better public services, in short, to retreat and do less. We are not doing that either. A third choice, Mr. Speaker, might be to throw our hands up, retreat, and expect municipalities to fill in the gaps. And we are not doing that. Instead, here's our choice. We're going to follow through on a plan that is working, knowing that the higher deficits compared to what we projected last year will be time-limited, while the return on investment will be felt for decades and for generations to come. And, Mr. Speaker, we will continue on our path to a balanced budget. We told the people that we were going to invest in more roads and highways. And does this budget invest in more roads and highways, I ask you? Yes. yes. We told the people that we were going to invest in more transit. And does this budget invest in more transit? Yes. And we told the people of Ontario that we were going to invest to build more houses. And does this budget invest in more houses yes. being built? And we told the people that we would do everything in our power to keep costs down 
no new taxes, no new tolls, no new fees. And we have done that, Mr. Speaker. In fact, we've taken action after action that together are saving the hard-working people of Ontario thousands of dollars each and every year. Under the leadership of Premier Ford, this government scrapped the tolls on the 412 and 418 in Durham Region, a move that will save drivers $68 million by 2027. <laughs> now, I'm told that some parties in this House supported the road tolls and voted against removing them. Well, Mr. Speaker, as someone who re represents a Durham constituency myself, I have yet to find a driver in the community who shares the Liberal Party's enthusiasm for a more expensive community. And to that end, Mr. Speaker, here's what the Get It Done Act does. We're proposing to enshrine into law the freeze on Ontario driver's licenses and photo card fees. And we're finishing the job when it comes to scrapping the license plate sticker fee by automating the license plate renewal process. And these measures will save the people of Ontario an additional $66 million over the next five years and hours of paperwork. And, Mr. Speaker, I would be remiss if I did not point out one more thing the Get It Done Act would do. We will be enshrining into law a new, clear rule that will, will require all future governments, provincial governments, to seek the consent of the people before being allowed to burden people with the high cost of any kind of new provincial carbon tax. Yeah. Now, Mr. Speaker, we are in a pivotal moment in which leaders from all levels of government, all parties, all across Canada, need to stand up against the federal carbon tax and the suffering it has caused. And when asked about the carbon tax, Premier Ford has always been very clear. He opposes it full stop. Here. Here it's a simple answer to a simple question. Everyone in this House should also aspire to answer that question just as clearly. Now, Mr. Speaker, it's time to return to the astonishing news about the federal carbon tax. In a few short days, on April 1st, in fact, the federal government is set to increase the carbon tax by 23 per cent, with so many people already hanging on by a thread. It's astonishing, Mr. Speaker. The Bank of Canada has said the carbon tax is increasing inflation, and when factoring in both fiscal and economic impacts, the parliamentary budget officer has said most Canadians will pay more in carbon taxes than they will see in rebates. Mr. Speaker. While we need the federal government to pause or cancel their carbon tax increase, we will continue to do what we can to help people manage the impact. And that is why I'm so proud to announce that our government is proposing to ext extend our gas and fuel tax cuts until the end of 2024. Ontario drivers will continue to save over $0.05 cents per litre every time they fill their cars for the next six months. This will save Ontario households an average of $320 over the two and a half years since the cuts were first implemented in July of 2022. You know, that's real money back in their pockets. We're also eliminating the 6.1 per cent wine tax and maintaining the beer tax freeze for an additional two years. As well, Mr. Speaker, a freeze on college and tuition, uh, university tuitions for at least three more years. And we're moving forward with auto insurance reforms that would provide more choice and flexibility to drivers in order to keep their premiums more affordable. And Mr. Speaker, we are also stepping up supports for some of our most vulnerable by expanding the annual income eligibility threshold for the Ontario Guaranteed Annual Income System Program for low-income seniors, and ensuring that the benefit is indexed to the rate of inflation. And this one move will result in about 100,000 more Ontarian seniors receiving support while increasing the support that eligible seniors get. 
And of course, Mr. Speaker, we have given transit users the break they dearly needed by working with municipal partners to implement one fare. Yeah. Now you only need to pay once when connecting from Go Transit, TTC, Brampton, Durham Region Transit, My Way, and York Region Transit. And Mr. Speaker, I hope I have a pop quiz for you and the other members here. Do you know how much the average daily rider will save each year as a result of one fare? $1,600. This side gets an A. <laughs> <laughs> because this government believes that every commuter, de uh, commuter, uh, commuter deserves a break. Whether you're driving your car or taking transit, our government is putting more money back into people's pockets. Now, Mr. Speaker, making it cheaper to drive or take transit is just one part of the equation. We also need to make it more convenient. So we are ready to build the roads, the bridges, the highways, the transit and other transportation infrastructure that our growing province badly needs. Today in Ontario, we are building those roads and bridges and highways across the province while investing in the largest expansion of public transit to be found anywhere in North America. So it's time now, Mr. Speaker, to take you on a tour. So I invite you to break out that old Ontario map, that road map, and maybe stick some pins in the projects we're getting built. In Windsor, I haven't said anything yet. In Windsor, shovels are already in the ground to expand Highway 3, with planning well underway to build a new interchange connecting the, the 401 to the Lozon Parkway. And we are now supporting a new interchange at Banwell Road and EC Road Expressway to support the Nexstar Energy EV battery plant. In Ottawa, we are designing a new interchange at Highway 416 and Barnsdale Road to support South Ottawa's growing population and jobs. And here in the GTA, we are advancing Highway 413, which will finally provide much relief to the GTA, saving drivers 30 minutes on their commute and supporting 3,500 jobs each year. Mr. Speaker, as the Minister of Transportation can tell you, we all know how many people across Peel and particularly in Brampton need the 413. Families and businesses and community leaders are calling for this overdue relief in face of opposition from a handful of politicians and activists who live outside the region. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, we won't let them stop the 413 from getting built. We will be there for the people of Brampton and Peel Region. Let's get the 413 built. Mr. Speaker, we could say the same thing about York Region, where we are, we are going to build the Bradford Bypass to give local drivers some badly needed relief. And let's move a little closer to the great city of Pickering, where we are planning to expand Highway 7 from two lanes to four lanes from west of Reeser Road in Markham, east to Brock Road to support the Pickering Innovation Corridor. And we're taking the next step in finally getting the Highway 7 project widened between Kitchener and Guelph by advancing construction on the Frederick Street Bridge. Now, Mr. Speaker, keep that road map open because we have a few more pins to stick in that old map. And here's a sampling of the work underway. We're also adding high occupancy vehicle lanes to Highway 404 from the 407 to Major McKenzie. In the Niagara region, we're moving forward with the QEW Garden City Skyway Bridge twinning project. We're replacing the Little Current Swing Bridge in northeastern Manitoulin and the islands. And we're rehabilitating this section, the section of the 403 in Oxford and Brant counties. 
Mr. Speaker, we're fixing the bridges and culverts on Highway 28 in Renfrew. In Northern Ontario, we are. There's the member from Renfrew right there, folks. In Northern Ontario, we are reconstructing the provincial highways, such as the stretch of the 101 through Timmins. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, we're widening Highway 17 from Kenora to the Manitoba border. And we're widening Highway 11 and 17 between Thunder Bay and Nipigon and resurfacing the stretch between Coughlin Road and Highway 430, 482. Nice. Need a few more pins, Mr. Speaker. We're continuing to widen Highway 69 from two lanes to four lanes from Perry Sound to Sudbury. Yeah. And in Wellington County, we're constructing a new interchange on Highway 6 as advance work for the Morrison Bypass. <laughs> we're rehabilitating the Bay of Quinte Skyway Bridge, and we're replacing bridges on Highway 417 in eastern Ontario. And we're widening Highway 3 and Highway 4 in southwest Ontario. Are we out of pins yet, Mr. Speaker? <laughs> because that's what getting it done looks like. Well, I hope the members opposite in this legislature are paying attention, Mr. Speaker. While some politicians don't believe in investing in roads and highways, we will not abandon every person in Ontario who is counting on us to deliver. That is why we are uploading the Gardner and DVP to make sure these critical highways will be maintained for people to get to work or get to home to be with their families. We will keep Ontario moving, and that includes transit. And uh, we might as well get a few more pins ready for our map, Mr. Speaker. And let's start in Mississauga and Brampton, where we have a few members. <laughs> where we are, we're expanding the Hazel McCallion Light Rail Transit Line, including a two mil a kilometer extension and loop in Mississauga through to Confederation Parkway, as well as a extension to Brampton Highway. Mr. Speaker, this is the right time to make this investment in these fast-growing communities. And Mr. Speaker, we are proud to bring back two daily trips on the Milton Go line every single weekday, moving forward with our plan to provide two-way, all-day go service to Milton. Yeah. You know, what we need to deliver, Mr. Speaker, is a willing and true funding partner in the federal government. This is one of the fastest growing parts of the province, and we are going to ensure your transit service grows right along with it. We're also well underway on no fewer than four priority subway projects in the GTA, including the Ontario Line, the Scarborough Subway East Extension, the Young North Subway Extension, and the Eglinton Crosstown West Extension. Mr. Speaker, this is the largest transit investment in North America, and we are not slowing down. We're investing in GO expansions in Kitchener, from Oshawa to Bowmanville and Niagara, making new investments in GO stations in Bramalee, Aurora, and Stouffville, all part of one seamless transit ne network. All part of one seamless transit network, one network. One fair, more communities served, more comprehensive service. Mr. Speaker, the GTA deserves better transit. Let's get it done. Yeah. Now, Mr. Speaker, we, knew we need to move fast because Ontario is growing fast. Ontario's population is expected to grow by over 5 million people over the next 20 years. Mr. Speaker, these people need homes. And to date, our government has taken action to remove the provincial portion of the HSD from new, new purpose-built rentals. We're also supercharging municipal efforts to get housing built through the Building Faster Fund. And we announced a $1.2 billion investment to provide funding to municipalities who have reached at least 80% of their annual target for new home construction. Milton is a great example of how that fund is encouraging housing construction. In fact, Milton, they did not just meet their housing construction target, Mr. Speaker, they exceeded it with over 1,900 new housing starts, a full 27 per cent above their target. Oh, 
Mr. Speaker, they are doing their part and we are doing ours, which is why we are proud to invest an additional $8.4 million in Milton through the fund. And to date, municipalities ranging from Toronto, Hamilton, Brampton, Guelph, Caledon, North Bay, Sarnia, St. Catharines, and more have all received building, fund, building faster fund checks. And in my own writing, Pickering has received $5.2 million for surpassing their housing targets. But we didn't stop there, Mr. Speaker. In January, the Premier told the Association of Municipalities of Ontario that we would be expanding the eligibility for the fund to include housing enabling infrastructure. And in the 2024 budget, we are taking the next steps by investing over $1.8 billion for housing enabling municipal infrastructure. It starts with waste and wastewater, which is why we are increasing our investment in the Housing Enabling Water Systems Fund. In fact, we are more than quadrupling it to $825 million. And this funding will unlock more housing opportunities by helping municipalities repair, rehabilitate, and expand water and waste uh, water infrastructure. And Mr. Speaker, this is vital to getting more homes built faster. We will also be providing municipalities with improved flexibility on financing for housing and enabling water and wastewater projects under the Infrastructure Ontario Loan Program. And Mr. Speaker, we are also investing $1 billion in a new housing infrastructure program that municipalities can access to build housing and labeling infrastructure. This includes water projects, but it also can include, include transportation projects like roads and bridges. $1.8 billion, Mr. Speaker, in total. Because, Mr. Speaker, we are asking our municipal partners, will your project get more people in new homes faster? And if they can demonstrate that the answer is yes, we are saying, well, we want to help. Our government is saying yes to building more housing-enabling infrastructure, so this complements the $1.2 billion that was announced in the Building Faster Fund to enable faster home construction right across the province. Now, Mr. Speaker, we're doing our part, and we need the federal government to do the same. To date, housing-enabling infrastructure has been a gap in federal housing programs. We're prepared to work with the federal government to correct this and get it done. So our message to the feds is this. We're doing it. Let's work together. Let's get things built. People are counting on us. Let's get it done. Yeah, yeah. Mr. Speaker, I want to highlight that our government's commitment is getting things built is more than just about housing. That is why, as part of our 2024 budget, we are also investing $200 million in a new applications-based community sport and recreation infrastructure fund. This will support new and improved sport, recreation and com community facilities right across Ontario. Because our growing population, not only do they need homes, new homes and critical infrastructure, they need sports and recreation centres too. They need rinks and gyms and arenas right across this province. These facilities are often the centre of entire communities where families get together, particularly in rural Ontario. Here, here. They are key outlets for improving physical and mental health, including for families with children and seniors. They are centres of local sports and community scenes, and they help bring the entire community together in civil life. And to continue our commitment to get things built, we are launching the Infrastructure Bank, the Building Ontario Fund, with an, with an initial $3 billion that is ready to invest and ready to build. Mr. Speaker, we're getting it done. And this brings me to one of the biggest investments we continue to make in our health care system. 
That is why, as our plan to build, we are investing an additional 4 per cent on average this year in our public hospitals, including investments that will maximize and expand our surgical system in order to keep bringing down those surgery wait times. And our government knows that connected and convenient health care goes beyond our hospitals, which is why we are investing an additional $2 billion over three years in home and community care. Yeah. And this commitment extends to the long-term care system. We all know that building long-term care homes reduces pressures on our hospitals. That's why we are investing $155 million next year to increase the construction funding subsidy to support the cost of developing or redeveloping a long-term care home. We need this investment in long-term care. And we need to continue using this funding specifically to fast-track construction so that we can get shovels in the ground. But, Mr. Speaker, as I think every member of this House, know, house knows, health care is about more than buildings. It is about the people. And here, there is always more work to do, but we are acting with urgency to get the right people in the right places to make the biggest differences for patients. Earlier this year, our government announced an investment of $110 million in primary health care. Today, we are increasing this new investment, bringing the total to $546 million over three years, starting next year to connect 600,000 people to care through new and expanded interprofessional primary care teams. No, Mr. Speaker, we expanded the Learn and Stay program to help the shortage of health care workers in underserved communities as well, in the north, in the east, and of course the southwest. We're investing $45 million over three years to enhance the Northern Health Travel Grant program to mitigate the financial burden of medical-related travel for people in northern communities, as well as investing $50 million for northern and rural communities to recruit and retain health care workers. For women and children, we are investing $15 million for mobile maternal care in remote communities, $24 million to increase access to the Indigenous Healthy Babies, Healthy Children program. And Mr. Speaker, I'm very pleased to announce the first new medical school in Canada that is focused on training family doctors with York University in Vaughan. Mr. Speaker, we have been there for our frontline workers, and that includes our nurses. That is why we are investing $128 million over three years to support sustained enrollment increasing increases in nursing support at public assisted colleges and universities by 2,000 registered nurse seats and 1,000 registered practical nurse seats. You know, and, and Mr. Speaker, as we have since day one, our government will continue to invest in our more supports for people with mental health and addiction issues, almost 400 million more over three years. This includes 124 million to support continuation of the Addictions Recovery Fund that will maintain 383 addiction treatment beds for adults who need intensive support and help 7,000 people per year. Now we'll move next to education, Mr. Speaker. Our government is continuing to build, including nearly 300 school-related projects, including childcare, of which there are 100 or more currently under construction, and making sure our students have the fundamental skills they need to succeed in work and life. <laughs> 
Starting in September 2025, we'll introduce a new kindergarten curriculum that will include clear and direct instruction in reading, writing, and math. Here, here. We are also investing $15 million for new digital math tools to help all students succeed. And our vision for education includes everybody, which is why we're investing $18 million in new special education funding to help those kids who need help the most. And Mr. Speaker, we're increasing our investment in the Ontario Autism Program by $120 million, double what was provided last year to help 20,000 children and youth enter critical care. In the post-secondary system, Mr. Speaker, our government understands the importance of financial stability for institutions to ensure continued high-quality education experiences for students. That is why our government, in addition to freezing tuition, is stepping up to the plate with a $903 million post-secondary education sustainability fund, along with an additional $10 million for small northern and rural colleges and northern universities. We are doing our part, and now we expect universities and colleges to do their part. That is why we introduced legislation that will require colleges and universities to provide students and parents with clear information about all ancillary fees and other student costs, such as textbooks. Earlier this year, we also announced a $16.5 million into the Black Youth Action Plan's economic empowerment stream which is supporting better outcomes for over 60,000 black children, youth, and families in Ontario. You know, Mr. Speaker, our 2024 budget also makes some urgent investments to help law enforcement protect our communities from crime. Mr. Speaker, parts of Ontario, and in particular the GTA, are in the grips of unacceptable spike in auto thefts. And just as uh, the organized crime rings behind auto thefts are becoming increasingly sophisticated, so too must we. The federal government, the RCMP, the municipal police services all also have a role to play. But our message to the government of Canada is that we are at the table and prepared to do our part. In particular, our police are asking for more tools, and we are going to be there for them. In the 2024 budget, our government is providing $49 million in supports to help police services across Ontario crack down on auto theft. <laughs> We're also going to be investing $46 million over three years to launch a new air support program, which will include purchasing four new helicopters to help our police services in the Greater Toronto Area increase patrols and improve response times to major incidents. You know, Mr. Speaker, these helicopters will help police crack down on auto theft as well as street car racing, carjacking, impaired driving, while assess assisting in apprehending violent criminals and locating missing persons. Our budget will also invest $30 million to provide new protective equipment to fire uh, departments in rural Ontario communities. We have always had the backs of our first responders who have ours. And Mr. Speaker, our government is also not shying away from investing to protect the most vulnerable among us. We're investing $27 million over three years to enhance services for individuals impacted by sexual assault and domestic violence, and $6.4 million over three years to provide legal support for survivors of sexual assault, children who are victims or witnesses of crime.
And Mr. Speaker, we are able to make all of these investments precisely because we are rebuilding Ontario's economy in every sector, in every region of this great province. Mr. Speaker, for two decades, the manufacturing sector was ne negatively impacted by the rising cost of doing business in Ontario, and market share was lost. Mr. Speaker, by 2018, Ontario had lost over 300,000 manufacturing jobs from the sector's peak in 2004. And we all know why that is. But no more, Mr. Speaker. Ontario has turned the page and is ready for the jobs of the future. Better jobs with bigger paychecks. And we have supported long-term targeted and strategic investments in Ontario manufacturing, including Volkswagen's seven billion dollar investment in St. Thomas that will create three thousand good paying manufacturing jobs. <laughs> including the five billion dollar next star next star energy investment in Windsor that will employ two thousand five hundred more workers to make electric vehicle batteries. and the Umacore investment in Loyalist Township that will create 600 direct new jobs as part of a $2.7 billion investment. <laughs> you know, Mr. Speaker, every, everybody loves a comeback story. Ontario is one of the heavyweight champions of auto manufacturing. And under the previous government, we took a fall and lost the title. But now we're coming back, Mr. Speaker, and we're investing to become better than ever. Down. Mr. Speaker, Ontario is back. And the budget 2024 builds on that track record. This includes our continued commitment to unlocking the wealth of critical minerals in the North and working with our First Nation partners in Northern Ontario to build the road to the Ring of Fire, which is helping bring prosperity to these Northern communities. And so we are pleased to announce an additional $15 million over three years to support the Critical Minerals Innovation Fund. We're also allocating $100 million more to the Invest Ontario Fund, bringing the total to $600 million to help attract new investments and jobs. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, the 2024 budget is a continuation of a plan that is working and working well. If you want to put people to work in Ontario, then Ontario wants to work with you. It also shows that when we have the courage to compete, bet on Ontario we will be successful. And let's talk about those workers, Mr. Speaker. They are the backbone of Ontario's manufacturing renaissance. When it comes to having a skilled workforce, I would put the Ontario worker up against anybody else in Canada, anybody else in North America, and for, ma for that matter, anybody else around the world. Ontario's workers are central to Ontario's plan to build. They have stepped up for Ontario, and we're stepping up for them. With each passing day, it also becomes more and more clear many of the best jobs of the future will be jobs in the skilled trades. Demand for the skilled trades continues to grow. Since our government launched the Skills Development Fund training stream in 2021, we have trained more than 500,000, that's half a million workers in the skilled trades and healthcare through nearly 600 training projects. And in the 2024 budget, we are taking this program that is working and investing an additional $100 million to help job seekers advance their careers. We're also continuing to encourage more young people to choose well-paying, rewarding careers in the skilled trades. Simply put, it's a career to be proud of. And that's why we're investing $16.5 million annually over the next three years to support programs that break the stigma, attract more young people into skilled trades, and encourage employer participation in apprenticeships. We are investing almost 
$22 million to expand the Ontario Youth Apprenticeship Program and almost $42 million to launch 100 new training projects. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, whether it is workers, patients or small businesses, drivers frozen in gridlock or young families frozen out of the housing market, our government is making our position clear. We are not stepping back from the investments that matter, nor are we going to increase the burden on you. By making these investments now, we can support our growing province. We have a plan. It's a plan to rebuild Ontario's economy, and it's a plan that is working. It's a plan designed to weather adversity and continue investing and keep Ontario pointed towards better and brighter days ahead. Nous avons un plan. We have a plan, and it's a plan to rebuild Ontario's economy, and it's a plan that is working. It is a plan designed to weather adversity and continue investing and keep Ontario pointed towards better and brighter days. And as I said in the beginning, Mr. Speaker, my father came to Canada with a dream, and we are making that vision a reality. We will make Ontario the best place to live, to work, and raise a family. A place where you can get a better job and a bigger paycheck. A place where you can feel safe and secure in your community. A better Ontario. And we've made our choice. We're choosing to say yes. We're choosing to get it done. We're choosing to be there for the people of Ontario. And I invite all members of the Legislature to join us and send a message throughout Ontario, throughout Canada and around the world that right here in Ontario, we're ready to build. Thank you. Yeah.